let's have a sort of starting point here. If you believe, a la Darwin, that we are one among many species on the planet that have been created by evolution, cosmic evolution, so in terms of the history of the universe, what, what do we want to say? 13 billion years, and then let's say three or four billion years ago, life arises on Earth. Right. Um, there's a sense in which if you're looking at Homo sapiens, OK, as a species, that this is a relatively recent development. Right. Of course, when we talk about Homo sapiens, which is to say, and, and I think it's really clear that we get this straight at the outset, Homo sapiens is a way of identifying human like characteristics in apes. But the concept of humanity predated that. Okay? So Homo sapiens is actually a coinage of the 18th century. Okay? No one was using this language before then. And this is where the great Swedish botanist, right, uh, Linnaeus, Car Carolus Linnaeus, you know, gave this kind of uh, very structured way of understanding all forms of life on Earth, right? Animals, plants, and also rocks, actually, right? Giving them what we now call in the, uh, in the scientific literature across the disciplines, binomial nomenclature, right? Two names. That's all it means. It's a fancy Latin way of talking about two names. Right? Binomial nomenclature. Homo sapiens. So the homo part tells you it's part of the ape kingdom, basically. And the sapiens part says, what is it that distinguishes us from all the other apes? Right? That is an innovation of the mid 18th century. Okay? Now, before the 18th century, people nevertheless, for some strange reason, had an idea of what it meant to be human. How did they get that idea? They hadn't seen many apes. Right? I mean, again, you know, we talk, and, and, and this is where um, ethnocentrism might be helpful. Okay? The reason, you know, all of this stuff that I've been talking about up to this point that has to do with the way in which we define the human, even before we get to transhumanism, has been very much part of Western history, right? Um, and Western history, as we all know from all of our political correctness courses across the humanities and social sciences, is ethnocentric. And so we end up getting Linnaeus, only in the mid-18th century, actually going through the trouble of saying, that humans are some form of ape. Well, that has a lot to do with Europeans all of a sudden seeing a lot of apes and seeing, you know, through colonization and, you know, the conquests of the uh, Latin America, uh, Asia, Africa, all these places, all of a sudden Europeans in the early modern period through all of these projects of exploration start to see all these creatures they'd never seen before, and they're not in the Bible, right, whatever, right? All of a sudden, they kind of look like us. Yeah. Right? And they even sort of act like us and all the rest of it, right? And so Linnaeus, the man who coins Homo sapiens, is a creationist. But he, are, you know, he's kind of sensitive to empirical phenomena, right? And, and so he sees that all these people from all these different parts of the world are all of a sudden saying, look, there are a lot of creatures that look like us. They're out there. They're called apes. They're all over the place. And in fact, they're so much all over the place, we can't tell the difference between apes and humans, which is actually about what a lot of what most of the politically correct people are arguing about these days with regard to what happened in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, right? Because you couldn't tell the difference between a native and an ape. They didn't look different enough, okay? 
So the point is, nevertheless, the idea of the human pre-existed all of this racist bullshit. Right? This is the point, people. Right? So let's take that as the first point about transhumanism. Right? That there is a sense that you have to think about the human in a much more kind of abstract, conceptual kind of way than the idea of a human corresponding to a certain kind of ape. That is only something that starts to get traction in the mid-18th century with Linnaeus, and of course Darwin, see, Linnaeus is a creationist, right? Linnaeus is a creationist who kind of starts to believe his eyes and says, wow, all these different beings kind of look like humans at the empirical morphological level, so we, you know, in a sense, we may have, we may have some relationship to them, but God did something to us, and that is to say they put a soul into us. Right? And this is where you start to begin to get the kind of contemporary disagreements between the creationists and the Darwinists. Right? Because, because Linnaeus has already bought into the ape story. And so he's thinking, ape plus what? And when you get into the issue of ape plus what, right, then if someone has a great explanation for how apes came about, you're going to be screwed, right? Because you're going to have this alternative history going on that can explain age, can explain all sorts of animals, how they came into being and so forth. And then all this idea about the idea that the, you know, humans are apes with a difference starts to kind of lose its appeal. Okay? Um, and, and, and this is a, I, I just point this out at the outset because I think if you were back in the uh, mid-18th century, before Darwinism becomes dar dominant, but at the time at which you get a lot of significant European scientists and philosophers thinking about apes for the first time, all of a sudden coming on their shores and, you know, being in zoos and museums and, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff, right? This actually changes in a very fundamental way the way in which people were thinking about what it means to be human, because if you look at the human, either in Latin or Greek or any of these languages prior to the mid-18th century, they are not particularly attached to a particular physical embodiment. Okay? And you can go back to the ancient Greeks, who are the most pagan people in the world. They have nothing to do with Christianity, Plato, Aristotle, all these guys. Right? Where's the apes? Where are these apes when they talk about humanity and so forth? Right? It's not there. Even if you, you, know, you look at someone who is very sympathetic to animals and thought animals were very wise, you look at Aesop, the fables, right? You know about this, right? All these fables, right, um, that, that existed, that, that are kind of very much part of our heritage today, right? Um, you know, the you know, the, the ant and the grasshopper, the fox and the hedgehog, all these things. Where are the apes? Where are the apes? They're not there. Right? Because there's a sense in which the idea of the human at the early stages, right, in the Greek and Roman world, and I would say this is true even in the Judeo-Christian world, was kind of open-minded with regard to the embodiment of what it was to be human, right? This is the point I'm trying to bring across. And this is the point that people who believe in transhumanism call morphological freedom. Now, what that means nowadays is a different matter, and I will probably talk more about that in the second half of the, of the talk. But I just want to give you the idea that the, the, the whole basic idea of what it means to be human has not historically been tied to being a certain kind of body and being in a certain kind of body in a certain kind of way. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.